when the Buddha was teaching the truth, he would talk about two kinds of truth. There's the truth of realities, and there's the truth of words. What he's dealing with, where he wants us to go, is a reality. The reality of the end of suffering. We suffer from the reality of pain, stress, and it's because of the reality of clinging and craving. But there's also reality of the path that can lead us to the reality of the end of suffering. So those are real things. That's what the teaching is aimed. But he has to use words in order to get us there, because we have to understand the way, and we have to be motivated to follow it. So when he talks about abandoning the truth of the cause of suffering, or comprehending the truth of suffering, it's not just comprehending the words or abandoning the words. You're trying to realize, where is the reality in my mind right now, in my heart right now, that's creating the suffering? And what is that suffering in my heart? And as you said, the way we learn these things is through following the path. When he talks about discernment, there are basically three levels. The first two, the discernment that comes from listening and the discernment that comes from thinking, that deals with the words. The discernment that comes from developing, that's the truth that deals with realities. And as you said, we learn about the mind not simply by sitting here watching it, but by training it. It's like getting to know an animal. You can simply watch the animal and you learn a few things about its behavior. But you don't really know the animal well until you've tried to train it. You see what kind of tricks it has, how it resists training. And then when, when the light bulb seems to go off in its head, you realize, okay, it would be better off to accept the training and follow it. You learned a lot about that animal. There was an elephant hunter one time who came to see the Buddha, elephant trainer. And he said, elephants are pretty plain, pretty wide open. He said, I can take a new elephant and drive it from here down to the next city and back. And by the time I've gotten back, I know that elephant's tricks, how it resists the training and how we can made, made to want to train. But human beings, he says, those are a tangle. This is why meditation can take so long sometimes, to get the mind to settle down. And then once it's settled down, to get some insight. Because it does have lots of tricks, lots of different ways in which it resists the training. But when you learn how to overcome those resistances, you've learned a lot about the mind. So the training here is to get the mind to settle down, be one with this object. In the beginning, you're not quite one yet. You're thinking about it and evaluating it so that it fits together. It's like a carpenter trying to fit two pieces of wood together. You cut them, and then you realize they don't quite fit. So you have to figure out which piece do you have to cut off a little bit more, which piece do you have to sand. So they get together nice and snug. If you sand them too much, cut too much, then it's going to be loose. So you have to have a sense of just right. And that's what we do as we think about the breath and evaluate the breath, is try to get a sense of just right with the breath. The breath feels good and nourishing coming in, relaxing going out. It's not too heavy, not too light, not too fast, not too slow. So fine-tune your breathing right now. And then fine-tune your understanding of your mind. Remember, your mind is not just up in your head. Your awareness fills the whole body. In some places it's more prominent than others. I learned the other day about how when people gain organ transplants, they pick up a little bit of the memories and sometimes even the personality of the person from whom that organ came from. This is most pronounced in the heart. So there's a special awareness, a special clarity of awareness or strength of awareness around the heart.
But you notice other, other parts of the body as well, that you can have a sense of you're here in the body with the breath. And your awareness can fill the whole body. That's ideal, because it's not squeezed or, or deformed. It's allowed to grow and fill its natural space, which is the body as a whole. We tend to squeeze it out because we use different parts of the body when we're thinking. Because our thoughts have to have a marker someplace in the body so that we can remember a particular thought. And if the thought's complex, there are going to be markers all over the body. And so the breath gets squeezed out of those spots. But now we're allowing the breath to have full range. As the breath has full range, the body has full range, the mind has full range, then they begin to become one. Now, in days when things settle down well, settle down easily, you don't learn all that much. Those are the days we like. But the days where we actually learn are when the mind resists or the breath doesn't seem to want to be comfortable. And you have to ask yourself why and what you can do to compensate, what you can do to correct the situation. This is where you have to learn to use your discernment again, again, more evaluation and your ingenuity. And John Fuin would use two words very frequently when he's teaching. One was, use your powers of observation, and the other was, use your ingenuity. When a problem comes up, you may think of some of the recommendations from John Lee or the other Johns, or things you've read in the canon, or things you've heard, or things you've noticed for yourself in the past. And you can try them out. And sometimes some of the old tricks work, and sometimes they don't. In which case you have to think, well, what might be a new way to approach this that would get some results? And again, you're learning about the resistance of the mind, but you're also learning about the mind's ingenuity. You're learning about areas in which the mind is in a rut, and you have to get it out. In what ways of thinking you find help to get it out? And John Lee would often recommend, if you gain an insight, you always have to ask yourself, to, to what extent is the opposite true? Now where you have, as he says, you have two eyes instead of one. And you also remind yourself of the possibility that some of the things you learn may, may be of use during some circumstances and not in others. There are some things that are true across the board, but there are other things that are just right for one particular time and place and then not necessarily right for others. You have to learn to figure out what kind of insight you've got, what kind of understanding you have. And again, the best way to test it is through training the mind. The Buddha talks about testing his teachings. He says you don't really know their truth until you've tested them. This is how you test them, through training the mind, following his instructions, saying, do this, do that, see how the mind resists, and see how you can come in and help with your ingenuity, either taking the Buddha's teachings simply as they are, or, they're, or working variations on them. And you've learned about both sides of the mind the recalcitrant side and the ingenious side. It's through this way that you get to find the reality of the path, and then the reality of the path can take you to the reality of the end of suffering. Because you're going to have to know the mind's ins and outs, both its good sides and its bad sides, if you're really going to be able to free it. Otherwise, if you hide the bad sides from yourself, to be a large part of the mind that remains untrained. And it just becomes one more obstacle. Wherever you're holding on, the Buddha says, you're trapped. It's when you learn how to let go. That's when you're free. And the only way you can let go is when you really understand all the tricks of the mind and learn how to use its trickiness to overcome its bad habits. And then you can see that the words that the Buddha used really do point to this reality. There is a dimension inside 
that is unconditioned. The path doesn't cause that dimension, it takes you there. Or, to be more precise, when you follow the path, you arrive there. Just as the road to a mountain doesn't cause the mountain. But if you follow the road, it, you get there. And you may have a map that tells you how to get there, and then you have instructions that encourage you, a tourist guide that says, this is a really good mountain to visit. And these are the interesting places along the way, and these are some of the dangerous things along the way. But it's not there just to describe the way, it's there for you to be motivated to follow the way. And to understand when you're on the path and when you're off the path. So the words have their uses. But the truth of the words is known only when you've put them into practice. And you see that they do deliver you to the place where the Buddha promised. <laughs>